Okay. Well, that's good. Okay. Uh, not sure what that's doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I've upset the machine. Um, okay. So first of all, um, there's some sort of background reading here. Um, so there's my work with Yarek Kapinski, who's uh, hiding up the back there somewhere probably. <laughs> um, oh, there he is. Right. Yep. He's going to answer all questions. <laughs> So um, we have a, a sort of recent work which is, attaches some of the things that I'm talking about um, to a little bit of a GR-related question. So I will talk about that. This um, article with Curry, if you're you know, genuinely interested in, in, in trying to understand more about what I'm talking about, this is, uh, this is an expository article, which is, you know, it has the word introduction in it <laughs> and conformal and GR and so on. So it'll... It'll um, overlap quite a lot with what I'm talking about, but not everything. Um, and then these are sort of some of the, um, you know, background places where things were developed and so on. Okay, so let's get started. I've got the various pointers here. That didn't work. Make no. Try that. Yep. Okay, so here's a sort of um, a guide to uh, what, what we're going to be talking about today. And it's going to start off very, very elementary. Um, so um, sort of basic geometry, you know, because I know there's a range of people in the audience. Um, and I wanted to make contact with, with people who are, in a sense, beginning. But also, um, even if you're a sort of... Um, regard yourself as a, as a sort of tough guy or tough person and you already know all this stuff I think it's worth just sort of listening in because I want to develop a perspective and the things that the elementary things I'm talking about at the beginning will will resurface um, <clears throat> so so we're going to talk about basic geometry um, <clears throat> and then the, the the sort of sort of theme is going to be to do with compactification so the, the, the idea of compactification or the need to compactify and so on is going to drive why we're looking at conformal geometry. Um, and so we're going to then talk about conformal geometry in this thing called tractor calculus. Um, and then um, what I call the geometry of scale and then how you use that to do lots of things, including compactification. Um, okay, and then there's a picture that you've probably seen before. Well, certainly you've seen the pictures of the world before, I hope, but um, <clears throat> there's some features I want to draw attention to. So first of all, there's one of these arrows is pointing straight at this lecture theater. That's, that's a, a good sign, I guess. Um, <clears throat> but think of this just as a sphere embedded in Euclidean space, right? Now, Euclidean space, three-dimensional Euclidean space is kind of, you know, as simple as life gets, right? So, <laughs> so there's not much going on in Euclidean space, you think. But lo and behold, look what happens, you know, so, so probably there's a surveying department at the University of Warsaw. So you give one of your surveying students <coughs> one of these little arrows or perhaps a burning Olympic torch or something, and you <coughs> ask them to transport it parallelly up this line of uh, longitude <laughs> um, to the North Pole, okay? And then when they get there fighting off bears and things, they take it down um, they do a right angle and go down the line of longitude, keeping it parallel, you know, because they've got lasers and all this stuff, <clears throat> parallel to the, to the surface and parallel to itself. So they take it down to the equator <clears throat> and then they do the trip back around. Um, and when they get back up to this lecture theater, it will have done a, um, it will have done a right angle turn, right? So, so, I mean, actually, you know, the last time we did this lecture, it was in South America. And so the right angle turn was down there, but it's the same principle. Um, so, so this is called holonomy, right? So, and actually this parallel transport that you're getting in there is the levy sevita connection. It's the parallel transport of the round metric, right? So you're seeing this, this rotation that happens is the holonomy of the induced usual two sphere metric, right? So, so <clears throat> this is kind of one of the simplest ways to see curvature and it, <clears throat> uh, so the other thing is that this shows up in navigation, you know, which is the other feature. Um, you've probably heard of the, the expression plain sailing, as it's often spelled, <laughs> which should have been plain sailing, and it is spelled that as well. <laughs> so this is, 
So that's the sort of wrong way. Um, but plain sailing is about this picture, right? Namely, if you're just sailing around um, in maybe a small bit of the Caribbean or something over here, then it really is like Euclidean space and the interior angles of triangle add up to 180 degrees. Right? <clears throat> but as you can see here, the interior angles of this triangle added up to 270. So <clears throat> the point is that when you're on a big bit of ocean, you know, it's not plain sailing. So plain sailing is when it's easy and small, but once you're, say, <clears throat> in, the, in the, uh, this case, the Atlantic, I was going to say Pacific. So in this case, the Atlantic, and you cover big distances, you know, you can't get by with plain sailing. So, all right, enough of that. Okay, so that was Euclidean geometry. We're all experts at that now. So the, the variant that, that um, people here like, I guess, is <clears throat> pseudo-Euclidean, and especially uh, <clears throat> Lorentzian or Minkowskian signature. So, <clears throat> so, you know, the Euclidean geometry would have been, gives you a metric on it. Let's start on a vector space where you just have a sum of all the, <clears throat> um, um, you know, products of the components in the usual way. So, so the Euclidean metric would have all plus signs. But if I make Q of these minus, then I get a, a, an inner product which has signature PQ. So you're all familiar with this. And then <clears throat> Minkowski space is when we make one of those. So partly I'm just indicating my notation. So the P will be the pluses and the Q will be the minuses. Um, <clears throat> and of course, this originated um, <clears throat> from the desire to make the speed of light constant, which was actually sort of uh, noticed, if you like, in electromagnetism to make electromagnetism consistent <clears throat> um, it, it, it with, you know, and experiments were verifying this, that it, um, they had to, they had to somehow, um, there was an argument about whether, you know, what happened with the speed of light, if you like. And these Michelson-Morley experiments verified that the speed of light was actually the constant in all frames. So <clears throat> the way you do this geometrically is, is just coming from the center product where you have this minus. So you get a null cone. And then <clears throat> you can see that the group preserving um, this geometry now is what's called O n minus 1 n if we're in dimension n. Um, <clears throat> and this is the orthogonal group uh, with that signature. And that's the group that preserves this, this inner product, right? So preserves this inner product. So in particular, it preserves the null cone. And <clears throat> with a little bit of work where you can see if you change your reference frame, perhaps the one that's moving with a velocity relative to the other, um, <clears throat> then the speed of light as measured in that new reference frame will still be the same. So this is the, <clears throat> you know, the origin of that being so important. Um, and then Einstein's special relativity is sort of built around that. Okay, so now, um, <clears throat> now we want to move to sort of genuine um, <clears throat> sort of uh, pseudo-Romanian geometry. So Minkowski space is a flat space, so that's that's a sort of simple picture. It's like Euclidean space, but we have that Lorentzian signature metric. Um, <clears throat> but more generally, you want to start with a manifold, which I'm, I'm sort of sketching by drawing a surface, but that you can think of that M as some manifold. And by the way, mainly in this lecture D, I had it on one of those slides, the dimension will be mainly D. <clears throat> so we'll be on a manifold that's D dimensional usually. Um, but if it has, so D is N plus one. <laughs> And the idea is that the boundary, when we have a boundary, will be dimension n. That's where the notation is coming from. Okay, but here we just have a closed manifold, a manifold without boundary. And <clears throat> what's the pseudo-Romanian geometry? Well, it means that the tangent space at every point on that manifold is going to have um, be just like the previous page, right? So it's going to have an inner product that has... Um, <clears throat> one of these pseudo-Romanian metrics. So in a pseudo-Romanian and inner products with, with P pluses and Q minuses, if you like. Okay, but, it, but, but now it's in a point-dependent way. So each tangent space is like that, but the, the actual inner product is allowed to be point-dependent. And so what you get is a metric on the tangent bundle. So 
Matchek was represent talked about bundles yesterday, sorry. So the, the tangent bundle is the union of all those tangent spaces, but then <clears throat> it's self-given an obvious manifold structure, which is inherited really from the underlying manifold in a, in a sort of easy way, right? So that, for instance, vector fields on your manifold that are smooth become smooth sections of this tangent bundle. And that's how you define the smooth structure on the tangent bundle. <clears throat> okay. Now, a sort of important point, right? Because you're going, oh, hum, yep, we know all this. Um, but here's something you also know, but let's think about it carefully. So when you want to do um, geometric analysis, you know, what do you do? Well, <clears throat> you say, well, okay, G determines a unique connection, and it's called the levy sevita connection. So that's, that's the unique torsion-free connection <clears throat> um, that, that preserves the metric, right? So, so... The important thing is that um, even if you don't know what torsion is, that this G somehow uniquely determines a connection. So a connection is, you know, if you like, a rule for differentiating uh, vector fields and tensors and so on, or it's this parallel transport, like we, we talked about on the, on the surface of the Earth before for our surveyor carrying the torch. Um, <clears throat> okay, and then, so the metric determines the connection, um, and this is a way of transporting vectors. And then this gives a notion of curvature, right? So the Riemannian curvature, which again, um, I'm even more sure you all know what that is in one sense. So you've been calculating that um, by, by commuting these covariant derivatives. And then you get other invariants. So, um, you know, you can take a trace of the Riemannian curvature and you get the Ricci curvature. Um, and then you can take a trace of the Ricci curvature and get the Ricci scalar. They are all natural invariants of your pseudo Riemannian manifold, right? <clears throat> because they don't depend on the coordinates you're using locally. They just depend on these invariant objects that you have, and they're formed in a natural way. And very important is the Laplacian. You know, um, <clears throat> you know most. Most geometric analysts will be suicidal if they don't have a Laplacian. You know, so they got to, you know, that's the first thing they want to talk about is the Laplacian, its, it's spectrum, or the wave operator. If you're in um, Lorentzian signature or the what do they call ultra wave or something like that, if you're in uh, higher signatures. So, so these are all important objects, and they're just determined by the metric. Okay, so I want you to just remember that. Okay, so now let's come to the sort of motivating problem. So um, suppose you're interested in pseudo-Romanian geometry or, you know, space-times Lorentzian geometry or Romanian geometry and so on. Um, but, you know, what happens if, you're, if your manifold is sort of infinite, right? So everything will be smooth in this talk, but you have a, a, a manifold indicating perhaps some topology, but it, but it goes on infinitely, um, by which I mean it's non-compact and let's say geodesically complete, right? So, so the, so the um, you know, geodesics are straight lines. We just talked about a connection. So if you had a metric, then you get the levi sevita connection. And then you can look at curves whose velocity satisfies this equation. And that's geodesics. Um, and if those continue, um, you know, for all time, these curves, then your manifold said to be geodesically complete. So, so if it's <clears throat> if it's closed manifold, a manifold without boundary, um, then it'll be geodesically complete. But <clears throat> if it's an, a sort of open manifold in this sense, then geodesically complete means that these geodesics can run for infinite time out that way. Okay, so. What are you going to do about that region out there? <laughs> okay, so so the question is, can we get a sort of good notion of infinity that's mathematically useful? And and then supposing, you know, one of you comes up with that, then can you work out what's the geometry on that infinity? You know, what's it going to mean? Because <laughs> geometry at infinity, right? So, so how are we going to make sense of all this? Um, <clears throat> and then supposing, you know, someone on this side of the room does that, then someone on the other side of the room tries to do it, are they going to get the same thing? Is it, is it sort of in some sense unique, depending on how you set things up? So there's all sorts of questions like that. So we want to sort of, we're obviously not going to answer all such questions because it gets quite hard, believe it or not. Um, but we want to at least uh, 
give you the tools to start thinking about it and to see some answers. Okay, so what? Are, let's be a bit more mathematical. So what is a compactification? So just in topological sense, it's it's a you know you compactify a non-compact topological space, which is what we're thinking of as large, um, by putting it as a sort of homeomorphic embedding. You know, so so a map that's injective onto its image. Uh, so obviously injective. So so it's a homeomorphism. So um, and it, it's a homeomorphism onto its image, but um, an injective map, and it should be open and dense in there. Right? So that's what we mean by a compactification. So it's open and dense homeomorphism like that. Okay, so uh, I like the laser, but I have to turn with this. All right, so here's some simple cases. So um, <clears throat> super simple. Um, so first of all, Euclidean space is big, <laughs> right? So here, here maybe is the Euclidean plane or think of this top of this desk is a little bit of it. And that just continues on forever, right? So we, in mathematics, we think, oh, that's fine, yeah, it's Euclidean plane. But really, you know, this is a problem. It continues forever. And to see it's a problem, suppose, uh, for instance, that you were trying to do some applied math problem and you wanted to put a grid on it and have things evolve in time, okay? So are you going to use an equally spaced grid? <laughs> Well, no, right? Because you'll have an infinite number of grid points straight away. And that's a first hint. And the, the same problem happens in analysis, right? So, so if you're <clears throat> trying to evolve things on Euclidean space, you're going to have to think about what to do with the infinite region somehow, right? But that, you know, and this is sort of um, not the sort of problem I generally want to think about, but it, but it does clearly illustrate that there's an issue, right? So, so, the, so I'm more excited by the things that come up when you start dealing with it. So we'll talk about that. But um, so, okay, so one way to, to fix this being too big is to add one more point, right? So that sounds a bit contradictory. But um, this came up in MatchX talk yesterday. You can do stereographic projection, right? So, so now here's the infinite plane. You set your medicine ball on the plane, right? So here it is. And then you take the North Pole, you take the straight line, um, going from the North Pole through the sphere and landing somewhere on the plane. So that <clears throat> is going to give you a one-to-one -one map between the Euclidean plane and the sphere that just misses the North Pole. So the North Pole becomes your infinity. Okay, so first of all, now you can go and have a beer because you've compactified <laughs> Euclidean space, right? So you can celebrate for a little while. But then you should come back and think about geometry. And I haven't put formal exercises in here, but here's one in the making. <laughs> so, you, you know, you can try and show now that that's actually conformal. So Magic was talking about it in real dimensions two, complex one, but, <clears throat> but it works in all dimensions. So, so this is always a conformal map, um, <clears throat> meaning it's going to preserve the angles. It obviously doesn't preserve lengths, right? That was <laughs> the, the infinite lengths of what we were trying to get rid of, but it does preserve the angles. So, so that's... <clears throat> That's on the one hand really great because actually, in a sense, in a metric, nearly all the information's in the angles, right? So we're in Euclidean signature. Not much is in the length. So uh, I don't want to uh, I don't want to argue about that or think, but, but let you think about that. So so this compactifies Euclidean space, hardly losing any information. So that's very very good, right? It's also a bad compactification for some. <laughs> For some reasons, does anyone have an idea about why it might be bad? No, no suggestions. What's that? For instance, yeah, yeah, but we'll come to it later. What about group actions? You know, because if you have a group acting here, you can transfer it back to a group on the sphere. And then you would like to extend that to infinity, but you're not going to have much, yeah, I mean, which you often can, but you're not going to have much information about that group action because you've just got one point, right? So the groups are going to act trivially on that. So that'll be, you know, so for some purposes, it's a really terrible compactification, uh, but for others, it's, it's very good. So it depends what you want to do. Whoops, not that. <sighs> okay, so let's, Let's start to sort of introduce some notation. Um, so 
So for us, we, we're not just uh, topologists. <clears throat> we, we will want our, 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 our compactification to be smooth generally. So, so <clears throat> for us, a compactification is going to be some smooth embedding of a manifold um, <clears throat> into a closed manifold, um, <clears throat> which is um, injective and so that M is open and dense. Um, and M bar might generally be something like a manifold with boundary and, and so on. It could be quite complicated. For us, we will, we will mainly want to think of it as just a manifold with boundary. But actually, mostly what we will need to think about will come out automatically when we start putting the geometry in. And that's one of the main points that I want to get to. So we, we don't have to sweat too, too much. But... Um, so first of all, what's the right way to do this when there's geometry involved, right? So if you were just doing uh, topology, that's one thing. If you were just wanting to study smooth manifolds, that's something else. But we're, we were interested in geometry. So, so how are we going to do our compactifications? So as I say, um, often we will be dealing with just a manifold with boundary in the usual sense. So, so I will draw this picture. This is mainly because I drew it ages ago and I just keep copying the same picture. This is a sort of Romanian picture. It's not so good for Lorentzian geometry, but, but, but anyway, we will mainly be dealing with a manifold with boundary. The point is this boundary may not be um, connected, for instance. It may have several, several components. <clears throat> okay, then the questions are going to be, um, if you've got geometry on here, how do you find the geometry on the boundary? Um, how do you relate the geometry and fields on the boundary to what's going on in here? And this is a sort of big theme in, in things like string theory. There's this thing called the ADS-CFT correspondence, which is all about that sort of thing. Um, and then mathematically, we want to, um, you know, if you want to play this game, you want to discover new links between different geometries, right? So, so this is what I think mathematically is super exciting. So you often get quite different geometries on your uh, boundary to what you get on the inside. And so this gives you a tool to relate these things in a sort of smooth way and use analysis. And then historically, you know, this has been used in scattering um, and the study of non-local operators and so on. So, you know, we should hope to get a handle on those things or some new, uh, new insights. Okay, so here's one picture that some of your, perhaps most of you, I don't know, will recognize. So this is a thing called the Einstein cylinder. Oh, yes, I got the correct updated with that in blue. <laughs> so this is the Einstein cylinder. So um, <clears throat> I'm not expecting you to immediately understand this, but let's understand at least what it's saying, doing. So here's a cylinder, and this cylinder... Um, you can think of it as just having a sort of obvious metric. So it's going to have something like minus dt squared, where t is going up the cylinder, plus, say, ds squared, where this is the, um, the Sn metric. Right? So, so it has the Lorentzian signature metric like that. That's the whole cylinder. But there's a way to conformally embed Minkowski space in that cylinder. Right? So, so you, well, in fact, two copies, right? So... So I've drawn Minkowski space there, and it's wrapping around and meeting at a point. And there's a point down here and a point up there. So that's um, you know future, future infinity, past infinity, and these these sort of hypersurfaces. They're scry, and you get plus and minus scry, and so on. So this is, um, I guess, if you like, if you if you know about the Penrose diagram for Minkowski space, it looks something like this, and that's <clears throat> and and. In a sense, that's showing up here as being wrapped around in the cylinder. Um, okay, so so there's some positive function <coughs> which will um, relate this the Minkowski metric on here, the usual one, to this to to this metric here, but, you know, um, just as a conformal factor, right, like that. So we we will actually sort of rediscover this later. But <clears throat> even later today. But here's the question, right? So, okay, you can do that. Probably all of you could go away in coordinates and come up with this. Now, you know, now that you've seen that it's there, you could just go and calculate. But <clears throat> um, here, here's the question: Is this the only way to compactify Minkowski space um, conformally? Right. So, suppose you want the Minkowski metric to be conformal, and you want to compactify. Is this the only way? And is it forced that these 
future time like infinity and minus time like infinity and this i know which is sort of uh space you know the, the spatial infinity i've forgotten what the point's called your will tell you so 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 they are points so is that forced at their points could they have been you know open sets in the boundary or something so why did that happen um <clears throat> so so but on the ha other hand null null infinity is this um you know scribe plus is this um open um it's it's a, a hypersurface <clears throat> um in the in the in the cylinder so it's co-dimension one compared to the minkowski space so <clears throat> so you know did that have to happen and then the, perhaps the most obvious question is why is this different to the look different to the uh, compactification of Euclidean space? You know, so we we did a one point compactification, and now this looks very different. Perhaps there's a one point conformal compactification of Minkowski space. You know, that's what you might you might imagine. Could could you do that? Okay, so we want to think about those sorts of things. Okay, so again, I'm I'm just sort of um i'll try this other pointer and see if it works oh, yeah look at this whoops no it's bad <laughs> okay i'll go back to the laser okay so so here was something that um I, I don't know if penrose first wrote this down but this there's a notion and i don't really want to talk about this in detail but asymptotically simple that you'll find in the literature um, and this is to do with compactification but also some global properties so every null geodesic uh, inquire, uh, acquires a future and past endpoint on scry you know so if you're looking at the Minkowski example then um, and then the null geodesics going from scry minus go up to scry plus and so on so you'd want that property to hold the more important thing I want you to notice here is that um, the, the bulk manifold, the interior, so I'm calling it M plus here for some reason, is an open submanifold of, of this, um, its compactification uh, with smooth boundary that's called scry here. And then the, the very important thing that is that there exists a smooth scalar field, that just means a function on M, <coughs> um, so this I guess is M bar really, such that, um, <coughs> such that this G bar, um is conformally related to the original metric so um <clears throat> so the original metric here is g plus so that's your sort of geometric metric or your physical one if you're doing physics m plus is your space time perhaps and so um this should be conformally related to another metric this other metric g bar goes to the boundary <clears throat> um but but not it goes to the boundary as a, as a, a um, symmetric tensor <clears throat> but it's not necessarily non-degenerate there. Um, in fact, it typically will be in this case. And, and uh, so that the, the, the boundary is going to be the zero locus of this function, and the function is going to have non-vanishing derivative on the boundary. So that d omega not equal to zero. This was taken literally from a source, but <laughs> what it really means is that that's nowhere vanishing on scry. So that doesn't mean that it's just not zero, but it's nowhere, nowhere zero, it's not vanishing at every point. Um, okay, and then this is called asymptotically flat if the Ricci curvature um, is vanishing in the neighborhood of scry. So this is some sort of definition that's in the literature. So, so the question is, how do we rediscover the Einstein cylinder and why would we come up with something like that? So lots of questions. <clears throat> okay, so... <clears throat> okay, so I want to talk about uh, first of all, um, the most simple, <laughs> perhaps the most simple and, and uh, easy to, apart from Euclidean space, which we've already done, the, the next most simple one, which is quite different again, is the compactification of hy hyperbolic space. So I don't know if any of you were here a couple of weeks ago and saw Penrose's lecture, but he, he had a picture like this. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if it was these fish or something else, but I think it was some kites or something in his one. But <clears throat> anyway, this is this picture is called Escher's circle limit, and it's a picture of hyperbolic two space. So, so the idea is that these in the metric of that space, all of these fish have the same size. Okay, so <clears throat> we've drawn it in perhaps a unit disk, 
but all of these fish in the metric in there have the same size. Here, they seem to be getting smaller and smaller as you go to infinity. <coughs> um, and that's because we're, we're representing it by a conformal transformation um, inside the unit disk in, in Euclidean space. <coughs> and in this case, when you, when you have this picture, the boundary is giving us a compactification, right? So um, <coughs> the, the, in this case, it would be just the circle that's giving us um, the compactification, a conformal compactification of hyperbolic two space. So let's do it over here with the math. So here's the Euclidean metric, right? It's just the sum of dx squared. All right, that bit there, that's the Euclidean metric. And then I've multiplied by some conformal factor. The, the conformal factor is four over one minus uh, x squared. So this is x dot x. So this is the ordinary Euclidean dot product. <clears throat> okay, so when x... Uh, when you're on the boundary of the unit sphere, this bottom line is going to be zero. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so starting with the Euclidean sphere metric, this G plus is going to become infinite at the boundary. Right? So <clears throat> this metric G plus is this hyperbolic metric, right? So if you calculate the curvature of this, it's negative, um, and the scalar curvature is a minus one. <clears throat> and um, what's happening here to make this picture is that, you know, the, the fish are all the same size according to G plus, but then if you multiply through by this conformal factor, put on the top line, right, then um, that, will, that will shrink them down as you go to the boundary. So that's really where this picture is coming and you'll end up with the, with the disk, right? Now, this is conformal because it's just, um, you know, on the interior positive function times this metric gives you that metric. That's what you mean by conformal, and angles are preserved, um, and and circles get mapped to circles. So these these uh, these curves are actually the geodesics or the straight line in the you know trying to be the straight lines satisfy this geodesic equation in the hyperbolic space, and they meet this boundary at right angles and so on. Okay, so the 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 first thing to notice is is that okay, so that's hyperbolic space. It's complete. It satisfies that condition, geodesics run for infinity um, on the inside. <clears throat> but this picture is just giving us, or this embedding is giving us a conformal compactification, right? Because the, it's, it's giving us this boundary with its usual, so this will be a sphere, this boundary now, with its usual round sphere metric as an infinity for that. Okay. Okay, so... That's going to be a sort of model. That's that's the you, that's the Romanian signature model for um, how we want to work, right? So 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 just to keep things simple in these talks, a conformal compactification of a pseudo Romanian manifold, right, <laughs> um, including you know a space time like a Lorentzian signature one, is going to be a smooth manifold with boundary. Okay, so some. So we have a manifold M, let's say, and a smooth manifold with boundary. The boundary is written by this partial M. And then what's happening here? So, <clears throat> so first of all, the original metric that you're trying to compactify is called G+. Plus. Okay, so, so this is your complete metric. Here's your original manifold. We want another metric conformally related to, the, to, to G+. Plus. Okay, so it's going to be... Um, I'm doing it as R to the minus two of this other metric gives us G plus back again, right? So G plus and this G bar are conformally related. But not only that, this R has to be a defining function for the boundary. So this is like in that asymptotically simple definition I gave you, <coughs> um, we're going to require the same thing. So this function that conformally relates the two metrics is a defining function for the boundary. What does that mean? It means that the boundary is the inverse image of zero. So in other words, the boundary is just the zero locus of that function. It's not zero anywhere else. And the derivative of the function is nowhere vanishing on the boundary. Okay, this is really important. So, you know, it looks like one of those things you can gloss over. Oh, yeah, okay, it's the defining function. It's really important. This thing that, that dr is non-vanishing on the boundary is what glues the geometric information of the boundary to the interior, or it's smoothly um, carrying across the information. So that turns out to be extremely important. Okay, now let's just think a little. <clears throat> I always, you know, 
imagine imagine that you're a sort of cave person reinventing this stuff right so you're in your european cave and you've been out hunting mammoths or something like that you by the fire you do maths in the evening right so <clears throat> you come back and you and you've done this and then you say well hang on you know so my, i'm really interested in g plus right i'm not interested in g bar i'm really interested in g plus this g this g bar is just a tool for helping understand it i'll compactify the space so that means that I could change my mind about a defining function, right? Pick another one and do this again. So what will happen to the geometry on the boundary? Okay, well, let's think through this, right? So we go to the thinking part of the cave. So, so each time you pick a G bar, it's going to induce a metric on the boundary, right? Let's say, so actually... <clears throat> I'm, I'm assuming that this 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 um, dr is nowhere null, right? So so this this so not only is dr not zero, but it's not null for the amp for this g bar. So just think of Ramanian signature for a minute. Then <clears throat> this this uh, each metric g bar goes to the boundary, so it's going to induce a metric on the boundary. But if you change your mind about the defining function g plus is fixed, that's your physical metric or your geometric metric. <clears throat> then when you change your mind about a defining function, it, <clears throat> what's it going to do? Well, if you have a defining function, what can you do to make it a, a new defining function? Uh, hat, say. Well, what you can do is multiply it by another function, but this has to, be, has to be nowhere vanishing, this function, right? So you can multiply a defining function by a nowhere vanishing smooth function, and you'll again get a defining function. So that would change, if you did that, that would change the metric induced on the boundary conformally, right? Because, because you're fixing G plus, you're, you're multiplying R to the minus two by some function, you have to cancel that out by multiplying by the inverse of the function there, right? So, so you'll be changing the metric that you're induced on the boundary. So what you actually get when you conformally compactify a, 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 um, a space, a space-time, or a pseudo-Romanian manifold is you get a conformal structure on the boundary if, if, if this dr is not null. It's more complicated if dr is null, so I'll mainly avoid that. Okay, so, so this is a machine for linking conformal geometry to pseudo-Romanian geometry. And that's, you know, that's what's been exciting to people and, you know, sort of doing these, uh, say, string theory, you know, people who... who, who <laughs> So it's a thing that comes up in string theory that people then study, this ADS-CFT correspondence. So, uh, but also, um, Feffman and Graham started a whole program of trying to understand conformal geometry by this idea, right? So you, so you start off with your conformal manifold, <clears throat> which I'll define properly shortly. It just means that you don't have a metric. You only have an equivalence class of metrics. And then to make invariance for it, they say, well, think of it as the boundary of what they called a Poincaré-Einstein manifold. So the boundary of a um, complete manifold <coughs> um, by, via conformal compactification like this, where the complete manifold is also Einstein. <coughs> so, so when <coughs> when this happens, um, you know, I'll say that the, the metric on the interior is Poincaré Einstein if it's Einstein. Now that's kind of sacrilege, really. If if we're not in, <laughs> in Romanian signature, it's a good name, and if you're in other signatures, it's a bad name. But just to be simple and not sort of changing saying all all you know six cases each time i discuss it i'll just call them all poincare einstein yeah so fifthman's grand grand program was to like relate conformal geometry to pseudo uh to poincare einstein geometry in one higher dimension via this picture um <clears throat> okay so okay so um I'll come getting close to where we'll have a break soon, but um, so <clears throat> okay, so we have these questions. I won't repeat them, but but to study these, um, at least for conformal compactification, we're going to need conformal geometry. So I should come clean and talk about what that is. So <clears throat> a conformal manifold, which is you know I'm going to denote like that, just M with with a C underscore. bold <laughs> c is just going to be an equivalence class of metrics where these things are all um, related by multiplying by some um, so if you have g and g prime and g are in this equivalence class then they're related by multiplying by a positive function and we often square it to make sure it's really positive 
So, so uh, no, there's representation theory reasons to square the, square the function. But so, so we think of omega as positive, and then we square it traditionally, and so that g prime is omega squared g. That's a sort of there's good reasons to do that. Okay, so um, for us, we're going to stick mainly to dimension d at least three. That's because um, conformal geometry in dimension two is is really the study of Riemann surfaces. You know, like Matic was talking about yesterday, and they're they're not rigid. The, the there's a, um a la, um yeah, it's a sort of different story. So we won't go into that. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so, so what's happened compared to our cartoon that we did before? So remember, we had a manifold and we said that pseudo Riemannian geometry, the tangent space at each point is equipped with um, one of these pseudo uh, Euclidean inner products. Well, now <clears throat> um, we have that pseudo Euclidean geometry, but you're also allowed to do dilations at each point, right? So probably even at primary school, you knew what similar triangles were, right? So so they had the same angles and things, but they could be dilated to different sizes. So you were doing conformal geometry. <laughs> you were the start of it. So the tangent space of your Romanian signature is just that similarity geometry that you were doing at, at kindy or whatever. Um, and but but now it's allowed to be point dependent. So the tangent space has that geometry at each each point, but <clears throat> there's a point dependence. Okay, so so we you know we we get uh, excited about conformal geometry, and then apart from compactification, why should you do this? Uh, well, one thing is that you know, and very relevant here, um, as I've already mentioned, well, no, I haven't mentioned, but the equations of electromagnetism, the Maxwell equations, are not just Lorentz invariant, but conformally invariant. Okay, so so the equations of electromagnetism do not see the metric. <laughs> They only see the conformal structure, you know. So this is a, a sort of important point. Now, it's, you should also think of it really important if you're a physicist, because you think, well, hang on, it was the, the Lorentz invariance of of those equations that that drove people to discover special relativity, right? Yep. No, I think it, that that's right. It'll be the largest group. Um, how to really prove it is probably um, through a kind of prolongation argument, um, but you'd have to fix gauges and everything because it's not over determined. But yeah, I could talk to you about that, but not here, maybe now. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, they said it was which the conformal group. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But anyway, what I'm the point I'm trying to make here is that that um, you know this as a physicist you go well, hang on, <laughs> rents invariance made us think about uh, special relativity. Then then maybe the universe is conformal, right? Because because it's um, they're also conformal invariant. And uh, actually, that's in dimension four, and <clears throat> which we sort of think we're living in. And then the Yang Mills equations are also conformally invariant in dimension four. So, so the, you know, the weak, the strong force and so on, that, that's also coming from a conformally invariant connection, right? And so you need this Higgs mechanism and so on to even break that conformal invariance. So, and give you, give you mass. Um, so the, the ADS-CFT correspondence in string theory, I've mentioned that this, is, this uses conformal geometry a lot. I won't talk about that in detail. Complex analysis, so already, um, Matchek talked about this yesterday. Um, Riemann surfaces are two-dimensional conformal manifolds. So although they're kind of different, they're also linked, but I, I won't really talk about the two-dimensional case, but they're conformal. Um, <clears throat> what about, uh, so in mathematics, one of the big questions is, is dealing with domains and complex space. So if you're in CN, right, so this is now CN, and you have a, a sort of domain, right? So just an open domain with a smooth boundary, and then one of the questions is, you know, when, when can you map to another open domain biholomorphically, right? So, so analytically with an analytic inverse, you know, injectively. So, 
So when's there a biholomorphic map between these things? Well, <laughs> actually, you can say, you know, <clears throat> you can look at the boundary of one of these things <clears throat> and what happens to the boundary. And it turns out that under a biholomorphism, a certain amount of geometry of that boundary has to be preserved. And that's called CR geometry. CR comes from Cauchy Riemann, but you shouldn't <laughs> just call it CR because it's sort of a different thing. So CR geometry is extremely closely related to conformal geometry. So, so, so <clears throat> um, if you want to study CR geometry, you should also study conformal geometry. But, <clears throat> um, but even more importantly, even if you're doing Romanian or pseudo-Romanian geometry, it determines the conformal structure. And it turns out that that tends to have a deep role um, in the problems that you're trying to do, you know, so if you, if you once you realize that, you can see that it, it's it's happening, um, even if you hadn't noticed it before. And then it's as I've already said, it's important in scattering, and for us for compactification. So those are those are some words from our sponsor. <clears throat> okay, so um, <clears throat> okay, now there's no distinguished metric. So the, the real problem is. So we're starting to do stuff now more. So <clears throat> remember, when we have a Romanian manifold, as I said at the beginning, the, the metric determines the connection. And then that determines curvature, a little plus in, and so on. <clears throat> the, the, um, now we're not going to have a metric. So we're only going to have an equivalence class of metrics. So uh, we can rescale by positive functions. And for that reason, um, <clears throat> we're going to need to use density bundles. So the point is that, well, how do they arise? So the top exterior power of the tangent bundle is a line bundle, right? So the tangent bundle, if we're, on, if we're in uh, D dimensions, has rank D. So, so if you take the default um, exterior power of the tangent bundle, you're now down to rank one, right? So it's a line bundle. It's not necessarily oriented. It's oriented if and only if the manifold's oriented, <coughs> orientable. It's, um, but if we square this, then you get a bundle that's oriented canonically. So once you square that, <coughs> you get a, a, a line bundle that's, that's oriented and so trivial, a real line bundle, <coughs> and you can take roots of it. So um, we call that bundle, let's say, curly K. And when you take roots like this, this will give us um, what we'll call conformal densities of weight W, right? So actually, none of that was to do with conformal geometry yet. But because you don't have a metric, you need to use these. Why is that? What, well, how would a metric sort of get rid of those? Lots of people answering questions today. Well, the metric determines a volume form which trivializes these bundles, right? So they go from the picture, basically. So when you're in Romanian geometry, you don't have to think about these. But now we only have an equivalence class of metrics. So we don't have a fixed canonical uh, volume form to trivialize these bundles. So we have to keep track of these. In conformal geometry, they're just as important as the tangent bundle and everything. Now, here's the, here's the sort of thing. I don't want you to get hung up on it, but I want you to absorb that it's a thing called the conformal metric. So although we only have an equivalence class of metrics, <coughs> um, there's, a, there's an object which has a weight, and we usually call it bulgy or something like that, which is, <coughs> um, which is a symmetric two tensor like the metric, but has a conformal weight and, and it's canonical, right? And it has the property that if you pick one of these densities um, <clears throat> which is of weight one, we told you how to make these, and, and is non-vanishing, say positive, that's what the plus means, because it's oriented, that makes sense. And then when I take sigma to the minus two times this weighted object, then I get a metric from the conformal class. Okay, so conformal geometry has canonically one of these, it's called the conformal metric. And you can think of it, if you like, that when you take its dth power, it's the thing that's mapping you uh, by taking, you know, by, by hooking in indices from this top, top exterior power squared of the tangent bundle to this bundle uh, curly K. <clears throat> now, once you do this, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between sections of that line bundle and metrics from the conformal class. 
So that's sort of how we often pick our metrics from the conformal class. <clears throat> and we, we, so we call these sigmas scales. They're picking the metric, they're picking the scale. Um, <clears throat> now, the important thing that I, main thing I want to get from this page, apart from the definition of those things, is that <clears throat> um, the levy severed connection, so, so when you get a metric from the conformal class, it came from one of these sigmas, <clears throat> that levy severed connection will preserve sigma. It will, it's parallel. So sigma is parallel for the levy severed connection it determines. <clears throat> and the reason is that, um, that the way the levy severed connection acts on these densities is just coming from the way it acts on top forms via this conformal metric, if you like. So that means that the conformal metric has to be parallel. And since <clears throat> the conformal metric is parallel, uh, yeah, for that's parallel for the levy severed connection by definition, this one's parallel because that's the definition of the levy severed connection. And then that means that the, the sigma has to be preserved by that. Okay, so there's a, it's just a sort of calculational uh, thing. What does mean this? If there is T star N and then bracket, Oh yeah, okay, good point. So when I write, <laughs> you, you know what it means for the audience, right? So, so we have T star M, that's the cotangent bundle. And then when I put two, that means <clears throat> T star M tensor densities of weight two. Right, so thanks. Yeah, I should have had that one. Good, any other questions? Okay, so now coming to this point I was saying over here that the next problem is um, since there's no canonical metric on the tangent bundle in a conformal manifold, there's no distinguished connection on the tangent bundle, right? So, <clears throat> well, remember, so, so what happens, right? So, so when you change your mind about the metric in a conformal way, so, so if G hat is F squared times G where F is some positive function, these are vector fields, then this is how the levy severed connection transforms. All right. Now, the, getting this formula is very easy. You just use your coordinate formula for the levy severed connection in terms of the metric, you know, the derivative gij, comma, you know, so on. Yeah, there's a question. Is this asymmetric a possibility or Of which geometry? Practor. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to come to that. Yeah, yeah. So perhaps I'll, I'll follow up. Yeah, so tractor geometry and <laughs> tractor stuff is just the, the tractor connection that we're going to come to. It, you can make it for all sorts of, of geometries, um, and then it captures everything. But um, yeah, let me, let me come back to that because we're coming to that. Okay, but the point is that when you change your mind conformally, it makes a mess, right? The levy severity connection transforms like that. This epsilon is basically the derivative of the conformal factor or its log, depending how you write it. And as I said, remember, analysts will be suicidal if they don't have a Laplacian. Well, they've initially lost the Laplacian, right? So here's acting on functions. Here's how the Laplacian transforms, right? So in dimension two, whoops, I've gone in N equals two. I said I work in dimension D. But when dimension two, you're in luck. The Laplacian is more or less conformally invariant, but in other dimensions, it's not, right? Now, there is this Yamabe operator or conformal Laplacian, um, <clears throat> but it's more complicated. So, we, you know, where do those things come from? Now, there is a way out. So it turns out that although all this bad stuff happens, there is a metric and connection on a tractor bundle, <laughs> um, which is which is just slightly higher rank than the tangent bundle. So we want to discover this tractor bundle, um, but we'll do that. We'll have our break now <laughs> and um, do that when we get back. So we'll, we'll start doing some stuff and constructing that. So uh, I don't know, how long do we want the break? Uh, five minutes? Okay, good. Good, thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so... Um, this, this compactification will have the property that, that every point of M bar, if you take a little open neighborhood, it will intersect M, right? So, so in de dense just sort of generalizes that notion, but um, you know, it's just like if you have a boundary, um, so here, here's your boundary of your manifold with boundary or whatever. So the original manifold was in here, but if you take one of these boundary points and you take an open neighborhood, it'll 
no matter how small that neighborhood, it will intersect the manifold. Uh, okay, and then coming to this last question. Um, <clears throat> that's sort of where we're up to anyway. Whoops, back. Okay, so the, the point really is that, um, perhaps I'll go over here. <clears throat> So it, we, we only have an equivalence class of connections. <clears throat> and so if you pick one metric from, from C, <clears throat> then that's going to give you a levy civita connection. Oh, that reminds me of the other thing. So, <clears throat> it, sorry for the camera. It, <clears throat> how do you get the levy civita connection from the metric? Well, um, <clears throat> if you have a metric, here's its, here's its components and coordinates, let's say, right? And then, um, I can't remember if this half factor is correct, but I think it is. So um, the formula for the levy civita connection, it's a covariant derivative. I'm acting on a vector field here, the components of which are VL. So it's the partial derivative of those components plus the Christoffel symbols contracted into that. And the Christoffel symbols are constructed from the components of the metric like that. So, so this is Ki differentiated partially with respect to K and so on. That's what the commas mean. So there's just um, a concrete formula for these Christoffel symbols um, from the metric, <clears throat> um, that the, and this was uniquely determined by the by this requiring the connection to be torsion free, which um, you know I can explain to you what that means if you need. But the main thing is you get a, an explicit formula like that, and then that gives you this levi sevita connection. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. So. <clears throat> um, each metric is determining a levi sevita connection, but we only have an equivalence class of metrics. So <clears throat> this one is going to be this connection G hat. <clears throat> and how this is, so, so G hat goes to that one. Okay, so, so this determines a different levi sevita connection. And that formula up there in the middle of it, in the middle of that slide is, is, is how it transforms. And actually, you can see it easily from these Christoffel symbols, because if I multiply this, you know, if I multiply G by um, whatever I was going by, F squared, <clears throat> so G hat is F squared G, then th these Fs will get differentiated here by these, um, you know, by J and you know, partial J and partial I and so on. And that's just generating those epsilons in there. So it's really just from there, it's like two minute cal no, 30 second calculation to get that formula. So with that, that so, so what you get then, you have an equivalence class of metrics, so you then have an equivalence class of levi civita connections. So in that sense, you don't get a distinguished connection. And you can actually prove, I don't want to go into that, that, that on a general conformal manifold, there is no distinguished connection on the tangent bundle. Of course, there can be as soon as you have other structure, you know, like if you had a, um, you know, something else you were trying to preserve. Any more questions on that stuff before we rock on? Okay, right. Good. Now we, now we want to start doing things, right? So, so first of all, um, I want you to show you, show you how to make your own conformal sphere. <laughs> all right. So, so there's two ways to do it. The, there's the sort of, um, if you like, the dumb way is you start with a round sphere and it has the round metric. And then you say, okay, now I'm going to allow myself to multiply the, 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 the round metric by positive functions. And now you have the conformal sphere, right? But, <clears throat> but that's not born very naturally because we started with the round sphere. <clears throat> but everyone here loves null cones. So, so let's start with the null cone, okay? So... So this is, um, you know, and if you're older and you have kids, this is, you can teach them how to make their own conformal sphere, right? So, <clears throat> so here we go. So it's a ray projectivization of the forward null cone. So, you know, projectivization came up in, in Magic's talk yesterday. So here is um, Rd plus 2 for some d, so you can make it low if you want to make yourself calm. So, um, and it's, I'm equipping it with this Lorentzian signature metric, so minus one and all ones, okay? So, so there's a null cone, and I'm just drawing the forward part of it, okay? Now, I want to ray projectivize that and get a sphere. So I'll put this picture also on the board. 
because <clears throat> we're going to need this picture quite a lot anyway. Right. Okay. And so here's our cone. <clears throat> we're in some Lorentzian, you know, we're in RD plus two. And we have this metric minus one, 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 one up. Okay, so then we get null rays, right? So, so this has, um, so, so just sort of like null lines, but just think of them because we're only in the forward cone, we'll just take the rays that go up and generate the cones. So these are, are null, you know, the tangent vectors to this line are null vectors lying in the cone. Now, <clears throat> what I want to do when I do this. Um, ray projectivization is it, that's going to become a point. Okay, so I often draw it underneath, but let's just do it here. So, so this is this P plus map, this ray projectivization. And so I get a sphere <clears throat> and that that null ray just becomes a point. All right, so so each each point on the sphere is just a null ray in that cone. Why not? Now I claim that that has a conformal structure. <laughs> How do I see that? Take sections, exactly. So this cone is a ray bundle by construction over the sphere I just made. So I take sections just as I would take sections of a bundle. So, so I take a, a map from here to, uh, back to here, which <clears throat> picks a section. So it's just a smooth map that meets each one of these rays in one point. Okay. Now, if I do that, then on that section, I will have tangent vectors and so on. And I can think of those tangent vectors as just vectors in Rd plus two. And I can use this thing to give me a metric. Why not? Right. So each section, let's call that section sigma, is giving me some metric on the sphere. Right, by identifying the sphere with its image in this section. <clears throat> but then the point is I didn't have I didn't have a canonical section, so I have to look at what happens when I do a different section. And I, then I get a different metric. So I have G sigma and I have G sigma tilde or something. And the point is it's easy to show that these are conformally related. And so I didn't have a section to start with, but if any time I pick a section, I get a metric and any different choices are conformally related. So I get canonically over here on the sphere, a conformal structure. And the conformal structure includes the round metric because I take the most obvious section here, which, you know, I just cut it off at, at, at T equals one or T equals, you know, whatever. And then I get a round sphere with the usual round metric induced. And it's easy to show that. Okay, so <clears throat> that's not related to any of the text written there so far, but but we, we see here that the, the conformal sphere is just born from this null cone in a nice way. Now, okay, so then I go, oh my God, I only have an equivalence class of metrics. I don't have any connections. And the, you know, I don't have my famous Laplacian. And, um, you know, how am I going to survive? Right. <clears throat> so, but, so we keep looking at the picture and we see that actually um, we do get a connection on, on, on a higher rank bundle on the sphere. <clears throat> so really it's just coming from affine parallel transport in Rd plus 2. So Rd plus 2 is a vector space, so we know what parallel means, right? So think of it as an affine space now corresponding to that vector space. And so you just know what parallel means here in, in uh, D plus two. That's what you did in your undergrad, right? So, um, so in particular, I can restrict this affine parallel transport to, to, to this cone, and I will know what it means for, for vectors in R D plus two or the tangent space to R D plus two. <coughs> restricted to this null cone. <clears throat> if I take that vector bundle on the null cone, 
then I know what parallel means for them, right? I could, I could parallelly transport along curves in the cone using this affine parallel transport. Now, that's not quite a connection on the sphere because the sphere is a projectivization of that. So <clears throat> this is restricted to the null cone. So <clears throat> what I do... Uh, what I do next is I say, I'm going to identify vectors in Rd plus 2 up the null cone if they're parallel, you know, related by parallel transport and on the same null, you know, and on the same null geodesic. I'm actually going to identify them. I'm going to mod out by that equivalence, right? So these two vectors are equivalent. We'll say, say these two because they're on the same null generator and parallel if they're really parallel. They're the same length and everything. They're just parallel, right? So then, <clears throat> okay, so if I mod out by that, but otherwise use the parallel transport coming from Rd plus 2, it's easy to see that we get a bundle on the sphere. Let's call it curly T, which has a connection <clears throat> just coming from that parallel transport. Moreover, that connection is obviously going to preserve this inner product because that's just a constant inner product. So <clears throat> I can think of this as giving me an inner product on this new bundle. It's obviously parallel up the fibers because it's just constant, right? So, so, so we also get a metric, Lorentzian signature metric, that is preserved. And we get a lot of other structures. So, so this um, T that I've just constructed, also has a filtration structure. And why is that? What is that? <laughs> you want me to say what, and then you'll say why. So, 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 we, so, so we have this T, right, which is coming from basically the tangent space to Rd plus 2, <clears throat> restricted to this null cone. And then mod this equivalence relation that we say that things are equivalent if they're parallel and on the same generator, right? <clears throat> and we got a connection <clears throat> and a metric. But it also has a filtration structure. So <clears throat> um, it has something that we're going to see shortly is, is um, <clears throat> like this, and then <laughs> something like this. Let's say the tangent bundle with some weight and then something like this <clears throat> okay so what this means is we're going to get a line sub bundle <clears throat> um, we're also going to get a sub bundle of rank say m has got rank d we're going to have uh, a sub bundle of rank d plus one and then we've got the total thing where's it coming from in this case Okay, so we have the tangent. So we have, we're, we're doing the tangent space of Rd plus one, but sitting inside here, we have the tangent space to the cone, right? So that's, that's the D plus one coming from the tangent space to the cone. Inside the tangent space to the cone, you have the vertical directions. That's the one dimensional tangent space coming in here. So that's where that filtration is coming from. So we get all of the structure from our picture. And our kids are really happy now, right? Because they've constructed quite a lot. Okay, so, so we get all this. Now, the point is, this actually works in the curved case. And this, you know, well, works. So there's a generalization of this to the curved case. But oh, so first of all, I'm going to talk about the, just to, you know, because to make the GR link. So what about, so that was that was doing the Riemannian signature case. Okay, so we got the, the, the round sphere with its conformal structure. But <clears throat> since we're, we're GR people here, we, we, we say, well, I want to get the Lorentzian one, <laughs> right? So, so draw me another picture. Well, I'm not very good at drawing this one, but it's the same idea. So now, now I take this, you know, with an extra minus, <clears throat> okay, and so that becomes my inner product. 
And instead of a null cone, I get this quadrat, which I've written there. <clears throat> um, and the quadrat, I've put the minus things on the other side, which is so I see that this is x naught squared plus x1 squared equals the rest of them summed up squared, right? So that's my quadrat now. And of course, <clears throat> Um, you know, to find out what that is, I take a section. In other words, I take x naught squared plus x1 squared equals 1. Why not? And that'll force the other side to be 1. And then you see that it's just s1 cross sn topologically, right? So, um, so the ray projectivization of this quadrat is s1 cross s3. And now you make the tractor bundle in the same way. The picture's harder to draw, but you just get the same thing, but with different signatures. Does everyone see that? Good. <clears throat> okay, now the point is that 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 this generalizes, and that's what we call the the, the sort of standard conformal tractor bundle and connection. Okay, so so <clears throat> um, so on a uh, on a general conformal manifold, right? So a a conformal manifold is going to be just a manifold equipped. <clears throat> so we manifold of dimension D, at least three for us, and it's going to have <clears throat> um, a conformal structure. So an equivalence class of connections. Then we get one of these um, conformally invariant connections. And this actually dates back to the work of Cartan and Thomas. So Cartan really invented a connection on a principal bundle, which is equivalent to this bundle. Uh, and around the same time, in, independently, Thomas really, you know, he, he literally <laughs> built it based on these sort of ideas. So, so he, he would have been drawing these pictures himself, right? So, but he, he, he sort of did it in coordinates um, in a bundly sense, but vector bundles were not really abstractly defined back then. So his, his work wasn't well understood. But, um, <clears throat> but anyway... So, and this was sort of rewritten down um, in work with Bailey and Eastwood and myself, um, in, in a sense, inspired by Penrose's local twister transport. The local twister transport, which I don't think Matt Chick's mentioned yet, is, is the spin version of this connection, um, and especially in dimension four, when it's, it's very simple. So you can do a, a type of spin tractors, which I won't talk about, but um, we will we'll deal with the the representations that are sort of not spin the rest of them. Okay, but anyway, so to, so, the, so the thing is that on a conformal manifold um, of signature PQ, you get one of these um, tractor bundles um, <clears throat> canonically and with a connection that that is conformally invariant and a metric that's preserved by the connection. That's the important thing about the metric. It's both conformally invariant and parallel for the connection. Um, the other thing that's important and is sometimes left out and or not well understood by people is that you get this filtration structure means that you get this, this canonical object that we call big X, <laughs> right? So it maps uh, densities of weight minus one into the tractor bundle and it's giving this filtration structure. <clears throat> now, do people recognize something from yesterday? <laughs> this is... This the the image of this, if you go back to our picture. <clears throat> okay, so so what does what is X in this picture? Well, X is represented in this picture by the homogeneous coordinates. So you might give them coordinates indices A, right? So this is say X, X zero x1 blah 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 up to xd right or d plus one is it <clears throat> okay so it's homogeneous coordinates for the point on the sphere right so that sounds familiar compared to what magic was talking about so the 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 in the flat case you still have x, so this is the flat case, by the way, the sphere thing. That's the flat case, as we call it. So, so you still get x is mapping densities of weight minus one into the tractor bundle. And what's what's the that's giving us a, a, a line bundle inside the tractor bundle. That's the tautological bundle. 
right? Remember Matek mentioned the tautological bundle? So here's the real tautological bundle, <laughs> not real, real in the sense of not complex, not that, no. <laughs> so, so, so the image of that is the tautological bundle. So, you know, if you think about what Matek was talking about, he was just doing a version of that, but working over complex and in different and lower dimensions. Okay, so, so this X is a very important object and you know you shouldn't forget it, and it, it's sort of yeah, su super important in the whole game. Okay, but anyway, so now in details, how does it look, right? So, <clears throat> okay, so I mean, as an exercise, if you like, I wouldn't necessarily recommend you do it that way. You could just take this picture and construct formulae for all of the parts of this connection, <laughs> um, you, you know, by by sort of just splitting up the spaces and everything like that. I've told you what the parts are. Right, and what you would find is <clears throat> that in in a suitable adapted frame, right, which is based around this x, you would get these three slots, right. So this row is corresponding to the vertical direction, the mu row that's tangent bundle to the cone, remember, and the sigma is the off the cone direction, if you like. So you would find that your formula for your affine parallel transport, when written down in terms of the metric on the round sphere or something, would end up looking like this. Okay, so you, so you would get a formula for the connection. And then, you know, you'd find, well, if you put the scout intensor there in general and so on, that this still works. So this is conformally invariant, <clears throat> even when you're on a general conformal manifold. So you do this transformation between, you know, of the metric to new metrics, the levy sevita connection changes, so does the scout intensor, um, the splitting into the parts of the tractor changes. And when it all washes out, this is conformally invariant. Okay, so, so this is this quite simple formula is a formula for a conformally invariant connection on a bundle, and it only has slightly higher rank than the tangent bundle. It's, it's ranked two more, right? You've got these two more line bundles, right, as we saw had to happen. So that any questions about... Conditions? So one is that we, you know, I'm just giving you a formula for it, and it's conformally invariant. You want a characterization? Yeah, but this, yeah, I mean, I mean, is there a set of conditions that Yep. Uh, yeah. So you could, so, so, um, yeah. So there are, but it's 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 a it's a bunch of things to state. So so one of them is to do with this x. And if you have a connection that when it acts on this thing um, is then injective, <laughs> in other words, every tangent vector um, <clears throat> get, gets, uh, um, you know, when you differentiate x with in a direction in a tangent vector, that, that, that is never zero in a sense. So it's injective on, on tangent vectors. Um, the connection should preserve the metric um, and be well related to this filtration structure and then if its curvature satisfies the Lie algebra cohomology condition, it's del star close, which is just like a trace-free condition, then this is the unique connection. So it, it, it's, it's, a, in a, it's a bunch of things that I don't want to go into here, but I can dig them up if you want to. But, it, but it's, um, you know, it's all written down, and, and this is the unique connection with those properties. But here we're just constructing it, right? So we're just... We're just saying, okay, uh, for instance, we looked at this model, we worked out a formula in the model case, and the same formula turns out to be conformally invariant in the curve case. So that's one way of seeing what it is. Um, or you can get it from prolongation um, of, the, you know, of, of, a, of a certain equation, as you know. But the, <clears throat> the point is, this is the normal, this is equivalent to the normal Cartan connection. So the one that's called the the, the normal Cartan connection or Penrose's local twister transport and so on. It's it's the same underlying connection. And you can rebuild the Cartan connection um, by taking an adapted frame bundle and you can reconstruct the Cartan connection from the tractor connection. Are there any other questions? Because it's sort of, yep. Uh, it's a comment where you sometimes write the tractor bundle as the weakness, but sometimes you have this other like half uh, direct sum. Thing. Yeah, so the half sum is just to, to say that there's this filtration structure. So what happens is that it's, you know, it, 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 as a vector bundle, it is a direct sum, right? So, so as a vector bundle, the, these are sort of direct sums. 
but geometrically or canonically, they're not. So if you pick a metric from the conformal class, then it's a direct sum, and you get sigma, mu, and rho, right? So if you have some invariant thing, some tractor, put the index down maybe, and you write it with one metric, you'll be like that. But if you change your mind to a conformally related metric, then you'll get um, some other thing, sigma hat, mu hat, and uh, maybe I I'll, make, I'll make this the hatted ones. <laughs> so this can be the hatted metric, okay? And so with the original metric, I had sigma, mu, and rho. Okay, so metric G, metric G hat, how are they related? Well, there's a transformation, you know, so it's sort of <clears throat> the identities here, but then you get minus epsilon and epsilon and a half, a half epsilon squared or something like that. So it's mixing up these components to get it in the new metric. And that that has this filtration structure. So this is an invariant sub-bundle, you know, just this the bottom slot. So if this was zero, zero row, then it's invariant. Um, or if you have zero in the top slot, that part, that's an invariant sub-bundle. Um, <clears throat> but altogether, the thing's mixed up by that action. Any other questions? So anyway, there's a, there's a sort of, these formulae give you a practical way to calculate and, um, <clears throat> you know, it, it's sort of algorithmic and, and quite simple. Okay, now very important also, there's a second order operator um, <clears throat> that we call the, the Thomas operator, um, because again, Tracy Thomas had written this down. So if you act on densities of weight W, so here's the density of weight W, it's just some numbers times the density to do with its weight, the dimension plus two times the weight, blah, blah, blah. Some, the, some of those numbers again times the derivative of the, F, that's the levi sevita connection acting on the densities, and then some Laplacian term, right? <clears throat> now, this is conformally invariant, meaning it transforms again by this nice formula, right? That's the hallmark of conformal invariance. <clears throat> um, so this is a conformally invariant second order operator that, that will be important. And it's closely related to the connection Yeah, sorry, that's right. It takes a density and lands in a weighted tractor bundle. Yep. Oh, and by the way, if instead of... What's that? Weight one less, actually. One less. Now, if, if this had had a tractor index or some tractor indices, it still works, but you use in here the tractor coupled connection. So, yeah. All right. Now... That D operator is closely linked to the tractor connection. Um, <clears throat> so here's the formula for the tractor connection. So what does it, what happens if something's parallel, right? So we should look and see what it means, right? Well, if it's parallel, then this first slot vanishes. So, so mu must be the derivative of sigma. <clears throat> also, the trace of the next slot vanishes, and that means that rho is then forced to be minus that. So in other words, if it's parallel, you have to be in the image of that Thomas operator on densities of weight one, right? Automatically. So that's partly where the Thomas operator is coming from, if you like. But also we can harvest some other things, right? Because if we have a parallel tractor, then, then if it's not zero, then that means that this density at the top must be non-vanishing on an open dense set. Why is that? I saw some nodding. It, it, it's in the image of a differential operator, right? So, so if it's parallel, it has to be in the image of a differential operator. So imagine it vanished on a, um, a little open set, right? Then, then this I would have to be zero on that open set. But if it's parallel on the whole connected part of the manifold, it would be zero by parallel transport. So, so if you have a parallel section, so suppose your manifold is connected, <clears throat> then it's not allowed to vanish in open sets. So it must be non-vanishing on an open dense set, right? So, so <clears throat> um, okay, so that's super important. Um, <clears throat> and also, where it's not zero, where sigma's not zero, then you automatically <clears throat> can make a metric by taking sigma to the minus two of the conformal metric. 
And actually, it has to be Einstein. So, so if you have a parallel section, right, which is, this is an overdetermined thing. In general, you won't. But if you do, then, then the sigma to the minus two of G must be Einstein. And that's basically defining where this connection comes from, right? It's coming from a conformal to Einstein equation. So how, so how do you see this statement? Well, um, so, so, where, so where sigma is non-vanishing, that's a shorthand for that, uh, then plus or minus sigma is a positive section of the densities of weight one. <laughs> because the tract is, uh, sorry, because if we work in the scale of that metric, right, so the one that are determined by sigma, then remember sigma will be parallel for the corresponding levi sevita connection. So mu will vanish. Okay, so mu will vanish. And this equation up here of parallel transport will simplify to just saying that um, sigma times scouten plus rho g is zero. If you divide by sigma, it'll say scouten is proportional to the metric, which is Einstein, right? In, in this sense, non <laughs> source, <laughs> no source. Um, what is capital? Capital D, D. This is this Thomas operator. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So capital D is that thing there. And that'll come up a few times. So, yeah. Yeah, it's it's of order two altogether. So that's right. So it's it's zero, one, two. Yeah. 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 Okay. And then going the other way is easy. So so this is, you know, and this is because really, if you like, another way of getting the tractor connection, it comes from prolonging this equation. This is the conformal to Einstein equation. You know, so this overdetermined PDE um, means that. If you're on a manifold and you can solve this for a non-vanishing sigma, it means that you can rescale by sigma in an appropriate way to make the metric Einstein, right? So, so this is just the conformal to Einstein thing. And if you prolong that, that's the other way of getting this tractor connection. So, but of course, you know, when you're talking about Einstein metrics, you should never let sigma be zero because the way we're getting the metric from, from things is by sigma to the minus two. So of course, it'll be sing singular if you allow sigma to be zero. So you should never let sigma be zero. So what we're actually going to do is allow sigma to be zero <laughs> because, because it's a linear equation, right? And so it's a linear overdetermined equation. And we've just shown that if you have a solution of this equation, then it's actually non-zero on an open dense set. So it becomes interesting. Okay, what the hell does the zero locus look like? And is it bad? What's going on, right? And, and actually, you know, it's a good story. So... Um, so you should do that. <clears throat> okay, so in particular, then let's let's start to answer that question, right? So, <clears throat> so you get a canonical stratification. I'm going to start putting a picture on the board because uh, <clears throat> the old story about a thousand words certainly applies here. This is very simple stuff, but <clears throat> uh, Words can make it look not so good. But basically, suppose you have a parallel tractor. <clears throat> okay, so it's one of these tractors. And it's parallel for this tractor connection that we just wrote down, right? So, and if you're on a closed manifold, we want to ask what the zero locus can look like. And I'm always drawing a picture like this. <clears throat> okay, let's just think of Romanian signature at the moment, but this will apply in all signatures, really. But, <clears throat> okay, now suppose for simplicity that, that, that IA, IB, <clears throat> um, HAB, so we have this tractor metric, and I'm going to contract those, and I, I usually call that I squared, right? <laughs> That's just notation. But suppose that it's not equal to zero, okay? Just suppose it's not equal to zero then what this is saying is that if you have such a parallel tractor, then you may get a zero locus of the sigma, but it has to be a, a smooth separating hypersurface, right? It doesn't have to be connected. <laughs> it, could be, it could be, you know, smooth and separating and not be connected. But it has to be a smooth separating hypersurface. It's just forced. 
Okay, and it, it's actually almost trivial. And we'll sort of look at this analytically uh, tomorrow. And when I say analytically, it's really undergrad maths, right? It's really easy. Um, <clears throat> now, what's I squared not equal to zero mean? Well, we'll also see tomorrow that, that I squared is basically the scalar curvature. So, so I squared is um, sort of minus the scalar curvature of the metric that sigma determines um, divided by some numbers. Okay, so up to sign. So if I squared is positive, that's negative scalar curvature. And if I squared is negative, it's positive scalar curvature. If I squared is zero, the the, then um, <clears throat> that means the scalar curvature is, is zero. But because you're Einstein, because we're parallel, it means you're Ricci flat. Okay, so the Ricci flat condition is going to be I squared is zero. Now, <clears throat> this picture is too simple in, the, in that case, but it's almost right. So when this happens, it's forced that the zero locus is, is either empty, that can always happen, or after excluding isolated points, then it's a smooth separating hypersurface. Okay, so, so it's only a little bit more complicated. And if you want to imagine what you mean by taking away isolated points, think of that Einstein cylinder case, right? So you had those cone points, but if you take them away, then that boundary was a smooth separating hypersurface in the two parts. So that was, you know, the, the Einstein cylinder was that happening, and we'll see that shortly. Um, <clears throat> now, the other thing to say, we defined a conformal compactification. Let me go back to this version here. So let's suppose the zero locus looks like that. <clears throat> then <clears throat> this, I've drawn a closed manifold, but <clears throat> if we're in this I squared not equal to zero case, then suppose this is m minus, and this is m plus over here. The plus and minus just means that on this side, sigma is less than zero, and on that side, sigma is greater than zero. So you know it's 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 stratified by the strict sign of sigma. So sigma is negative, zero, and positive, right? <clears throat> okay. Suppose you take out m minus, so just delete that. What are you left with? you're left with a conformal compactification of a Poincaré-Einstein manifold. Because this, I was parallel, so you're Einstein over here. Okay, but you're only almost Einstein because you have the zero locus. But the way you're getting the metric is by sigma to the minus two of the conformal metric. <clears throat> where sigma zero, if I squared's not zero, where sigma zero, grad sigma, is nowhere vanishing, okay? So grad sigma is nowhere vanishing along the surface. So <clears throat> you're automatically getting um, this thing divided into a gluing along the infinity of Poincaré-Einstein manifolds. So, you know, sort of for free, right? I mean, it's just, that that's what has to happen if you have one of these, <clears throat> and, and you can. So, so that's what it's saying down here. So M plus plus M zero, that's the zero locus, is a conformal compactification of that. Um, <clears throat> in this case, it's Poincaré-Einstein because we're dealing with the parallel case. We will relax that a bit um, in, in tomorrow's lecture. Okay, any questions about the answer? I haven't explained quite how you get all this yet, but, but you'll see that it's mainly pretty easy. Right? So it's mainly back of the envelope stuff. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so there's the picture. I've already drawn it, but that's just saying what I just said there. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll move on from that. Okay, so, all right. Okay, so, you know, we've, we've developed some tools now, and... Um, if we now think that we're tough guys with tractors and things, we should be able to see all these things we were talking about before, but these compactifications in this picture, right? So we talked about the one-point compactification of Euclidean space, the, the Einstein cylinder, um, <clears throat> um, you know, and, you know, surely these should show up, right? They're, they're conformal compactifications. So, so does that happen? Okay, so back to this picture, <laughs> right? Now, 
we want to rediscover <laughs> Escher's picture, right? So we will rediscover this thing, paint fish on it, and make lots of money, right? But no, we want to we want to use math to kind of just come up with this compactification, right? I mean, apart from sort of writing it down. So of course you can calculate the curvature here and everything, but but we should be able to just see this now, right? We, you know, it, I mean, perhaps in real time for you it's hard, but if if you if you you know once you've absorbed what I've said before. Um, you'll see that, aha, uh -huh, you know, I can just see where this comes from. So let's do that. Okay, so we're back to this picture, right? So, <clears throat> so you know, your, your kids have had a big sleep and yesterday they discovered the, the uh, conformal sphere. So, so you know, now, now you say, okay, you're going to discover the compactification of hyperbolic space, right? So, so you take them back to the same thing they were working on yesterday and say, look, now just do a little bit more. So, um, okay, so how does that work, right? So, so first of all, remember what we had. We had um, RD plus two, just equipped with the Lorentzian metric. So we had a null cone. Uh, then we took the ray projectivization of that and we got a sphere and we observed that it had a conformal structure. What's that got to do with compactifying hyperbolic space? Okay. So, so this is just reminding what we had there. The sphere is this ray projectivization of um, this forward null cone, and it's a model for conformal geometry. And then in this, right, so, so um, OD plus 1, 1 acts transitively. This was something I mentioned right at the beginning of the talk. Um, so in particular, we could restrict to SO and perhaps even the connected component of that. That's what I mean by the little zero. Um, so this is a Lie group, and when I say that acts transitively, so that means that any point on the sphere is mapped to any other point by this by this Lie group, right? So the whole sphere is a homogeneous space, as we say, for this for this Lie group. Okay. Now, now I want to spoil it. You know, it's like when someone splashes paint on your nice thing or something. I want to break this symmetry by doing, doing something. So what am I going to do? Well, let's pick a space-like vector. I call it I, right? So sort of suggestively I, <laughs> right? So I'm going to just pick a constant vector. There it is. And think of it as being space-like. So if suppose, um, you know, in, in the notation of, of uh, that, that metric, you know, perhaps my co-vector is 0, 0, 0, 1, right? In that metric, that would square to one. <laughs> so that's what I mean by space-like. Okay, so I pick something like that and call it I. What happens to my picture, right? So, well, one thing I can do, I can form this homogeneous degree one polynomial by just contracting the coordinates into that. Why not? And I'll call that sigma tilde. Okay? Now... If I do that, then when I put sigma tilde equals to one, for instance, that will give me a hyperplane in Rd plus two. That hyperplane will intersect the cone. There, I've got it with the dotted line. Or I could put it equal to zero and it'll intersect the cone and I've got the dotted line. Okay, what's the geometry on the zero one? You all know this. It's the same. It's just one dimension down, right? Because I'm doing a ray projectivization. This is this dotted line is really a cone of one less dimension. So it has a conformal structure and it's on the equator there, right? On my sphere with its conformal structure. What about the section one? What does that have? Hint, the, the ancient Greeks knew this. It's a hyperbolic section, right? It's a hyperbolic metric. <laughs> Right, so 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 this, if you you know work it out, that gets induced the hyperbolic metric. But actually, this is the conformal compactification of hyperbolic space. So you can <clears throat> you can play around with this picture and see that well, there's various ways of doing it. Okay, so from the tractor point of view, this I is constant. The tractor connection came from aff affine parallel transport, so it's one of these almost Einstein things, and this has to be <laughs> the compactification. Right, 
This is the flat tractor connection is coming. So this has to be the hyperbolic compactification. Or you could work it out in slots and see that this hyperbolic metric is the sigma to the minus two of that thing, that the derivative is not zero on the boundary. Um, <clears throat> the other way you can do it is, is observe that this was conformal. We've taken a section and now do stereographic projection of this sphere onto a plane, you know, draw a plane up the back here, do stereographic projection from this pole, and it'll actually project onto a, uh, you know, onto a, uh, what to, it's a, an RD in the back here. Does everyone see my picture? So <clears throat> I'm drawing a plane here and, and doing stereographic projection now from there, and it'll project this uh, onto the cone, and you, you really have the, the fish picture. <laughs> you really have the usual compactification of hyperbolic space when you do that. Okay, so this I being space-like broke my symmetry. <clears throat> um, it's it's constant, so it's a parallel tractor. Um, and then, you know, we knew this was inducing an Einstein metric because this is constant. Uh, this is parallel. Um, it's length squared telling us the the curvature because the length squared is positive, the curvature is negative. So you see that it has to be the hyperbolic metric. So there's all sorts of ways of understanding it now. <clears throat> um, and this is the Conformal compactification of hyperbolic space. So we've we've rediscovered that. <clears throat> okay, now we we you know as I say we're we're at a GR conference, so we should talk about something with more signatures. So look at that now. This other picture. So we start off with this, <clears throat> in, you know, this bilinear form where we have two minuses. So I've still got it here, um, <clears throat> and then as I said before, now the quadric is not a cone, but it's a um, it's a, it's ray projectivization as S1 cross Sn. Now the group acting transitively is SOD comma two. Um, <clears throat> and then, but everything else about the picture is sort of the same. You pick up, you pick one of these constant vectors, it'll correspond to a parallel tractor. If you pick one with I squared equals minus one, that's going to correspond to positive curvature because of the sign difference, right? So, so I squared negative is positive curvature. So you, you know, it's going to divide your S1 cross Sn into two parts, each of which is Einstein with positive curvature. So this is two, two copies of De Sitter and you get their compactifications by the separating hypersurface. Um, if I squared is zero, um, then you're going to get two copies of what? Well, it's Einstein and Ricci flat. So it's two copies of Minkowski space um, conformally compactified. And this is giving you the Einstein cylinder, but now with the endpoints joined up. So it's an S1 cross SM. And then if I squared equals one, um, it's two, now got negative curvature. So two copies of anti de space. And you can see that this, this I is freezing off different parts of the group. So, you know, um, if you take I squared to be negative, uh, then um, I is, uh, is sort of time-like. So it's freezing off one of those. So SOD2 goes down to SOD1. That's the group that's preserving the new structure. And then if it's null, you get a Poincaré group and, and the other way the other case. Okay, so... Um, <clears throat> So now over to Yarek. Do you want to come down, Yarek? <laughs> so, so Yarek, you know, to to um, <clears throat> sort of put it in familiar terms, just you know, wrote this in coordinates. So, so now we're doing R six. We're trying to land in four dimensions. So here's this metric with signature with the two minus ones and the rest of the the pluses. <clears throat> um, now, if you introduce sort of polar type coordinates. Um, you get a S3 metric, and then he's using sine and cos for the for the two these two bits, the, the two negative bits. And then the, this this metric looks like that, right? So so um, if you sorry, if you if you restrict to the cone, right? So the cone is now going to be little r equals big R in terms of these coordinates. So little r coordinates on the on this positive bit and big R on this negative bit. So the cone is where little r is big R. So the sort of dr squared cancels with the, the minus dr squared cancels with that. So you get this degenerate metric on the cone. Um, <clears throat> and then you can look at what that gives you for each of those slices. And so 
uh, so here he's taking uh, IDS to be DDV. So let's just go back. So DDV, that was the second coordinate. So in, in my sort of notation, he's taking um, I uh, to be zero, sort of one, but with a factor <laughs> equals. So there's some number here, which is to do with the cosmological constant and then zeros, right? <clears throat> so that's that's going to square to something negative because it's um, <clears throat> it's in those first slots. So that's what's taken this DDV, uh, and then this is just a factor to make the the numbers work out how, how they usually would do it in GR <clears throat> literature. Um, and then you know this is just this sigma is just this x contracted into i, right? So you so you now contract this with the coordinates, <clears throat> which is, you know which were uh, u v blah 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 and so this will pick out the v up to a factor and that's the sigma that he's got there and then in, in the coordinates he's introduced this is r cos th cos t and so this splits s1 cross s3 this cos is referring to the s1 into the the two copies of the s1 cross s3 and you get induced this metric in concrete terms and i think you know this is one of the ways it's written down in the gr literature so then, you know, you can do the other cases just the same. Um, <clears throat> so this is the space light one. And this time, um, you know, you, he's picking instead of zero, one, it's going to be this time um, <clears throat> IA equals zero, zero, one, but up to some, some lambda, something that he's putting at the start here. And then... <clears throat> um, this time, the, 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 the splitting is going to split the S3 into two parts, right? So, you, so now you get um, two copies of anti de Sitter space glued along their um, time-like infinities, right? So the, the infinity is going to have a Lorentzian signature now <coughs> with a conformal structure. And then the Einstein metric is just coming out from this, you know, the, the metric we had over the sigma squared. Okay, but in coordinates now, and then the null case is similar. Um, so he's now sort of adding these two <laughs> to get a null vector and doing that case and putting in the coordinates and so on and, and getting there. A, a familiar formula, apparently, you know, I, I try to not look at these coordinate formulas. They always confuse me. But um, okay, so that's it. <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> okay. So, uh, is it correct that uh, um, if a uh, space time, if, if this uh, conformal class is conformally Einstein, then the connection always uh, allows a parallel vector? Parallel tractor, yeah. Space time. Transversal. You mean if you work in the fifth gram ambient space time? Yeah. Yes, yeah. So there's this metric called the fifth gram ambient metric, which people associate to conformal manifolds. And yes, if it's conformally Einstein. So the so in the ambient picture, the tractor connection is the ambient connection restricted to the initial hypersurface. It's sort of just like the model, but in the curve case. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then, right, yeah, okay. Yeah. Does what? Yeah. Okay. So, well, there's, there's kind of two questions in there. So, if you have a space time, you have a metric, you have a conformal structure, right? So, you can use these tools. Um, so, um, but if, if, if it has or you want a conformal compactification, yeah, it, it's, it's, 
sort of the or a right tool. You know, there's fine print to this. You know, like there's lots of <laughs> lots of things to say about this, but but basically, yes, yeah, it's it's the right thing. And I I'll, I'll be continuing. So a lot of the talk will be about compactification, but I'll also in the last lecture talk about another way of of compactifying space times, which is by projective compactification. So um, so that's using, instead of the conformal structure, you're using the geodesic structure of a Romanian space. Um, and when you look at the, the geodesics of a connection up to reparameterization, right? So you're allowed to rechange the parameterization. That's what's called a projective structure. So if you think about it, that's another sort of natural way to consider compactifying things. Yep. Okay. Oh, yep. Uh, this conformal factor is the gradient shift determined. Could be null. So, 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 yeah, my, mainly the, the, yeah, so, 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 no, no, yeah, so on the boundary, right, yeah, so that it should not be, yeah. Yeah, so, so when you, yeah, if you're doing one of these, suppose we're trying to compactify here, then you normally, the you know, what you want is a defining function for this boundary, and you want the dr is is I'll say not zero, but I really mean it's nowhere vanishing on the boundary. So that's the normal thing that you want to get because that gives you a strong connection between the uh, first of all the smooth structure of that thing and the interior, but then also the geometry. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. So no, no, it should be not zero, um, but it can be it can be null, right? So. So when when you do the um, the um, compactification of Minkowski space, right, <clears throat> then then this will be null along the boundary. So the, when you use this parallel tractor, right, <clears throat> the we have the sigma and we're dealing with grad sigma, but basically it's think of it like a function. And then this is null if i squared is zero. So when you're doing the Ricci flat cases, you have to deal with these null things. But I'll be mainly avoiding that in these talks because it's a lot more complicated and we don't know how to deal with everything that, in that case. But when when you're dealing with um, cosmological constant not zero, if you like, so so the I squared is not zero, then um, then it sort of lots of really nice things happen, and I will talk about that. And you know, one of the sort of open problems in the area in some sense is to get the right way to extend that to also understanding the um, asymptotically flat cases in as, in as good a way. Yep. How do you get the unique connection? You mentioned the, the unique connection on the tractor bundle? Well, um, so first of all, we just, you know, I'm giving you a formula for a connection. I'm not proving that it's unique. Um, but you you can prove that it is the unique, it is the normal Cartan connection. So, um, and then the characterization is is kind of um, it's a little bit complicated to say, but it's linked to the Lie algebra that's around. So you know it should be a connection that preserves the tractor metric because you have this underlying uh, conformal group around that's trying to preserve the tractor metric. Um, it should be linked to the filtration, and one of the main things is that this grad x so for any vector v in the tangent bundle this should be not zero so at every point you know so this is a sort of non-degeneracy condition um so there's <clears throat> if it preserves the tractor metric um it has this property and the curvature of the tractor connection so i haven't told you what that is but it has a curvature um, then this should satisfy a, a Lie algebra cohomology condition. But this Lie algebra cohomology condition is, is basically trace freeness of the vial tensor in a sense. So, you, you know, every time you would make a, a sort of attempt at a tractor connection, you'd get a piece that was trying to be the vial curvature. Um, and the ones that had trace free vial curvature would be the normal ones. Yeah. Um, it's it's the Lie algebra cohomology coming from um, a part of the conformal group. Yeah, so it's coming from part of the parabolic basin. Yeah. 
Dulce, yeah, Dulce. <laughs> I, I, you know, if anyone wants to know in detail, I can explain this later, but it's, yeah, it's a few steps. Okay, seems good. Thank you, guys. <laughs>